Good day, everyone, and a virtual welcome to the Canada School of Public Service. My name is Nathalie lavierdez Jodouin. I'm the Vice President of Public Sector Operations and Inclusion Learning here at the school, and I'm really thrilled to be with you today. This event will be in English with simultaneous interpretation available, um, should you wish to avail yourselves of it. Before we go any further, I do want to acknowledge that the land on which I join you today is the unceded territory of the Anishinaabe Algonquin people. Some of you may be viewing this from various parts of the country, and I do encourage you to take a moment to recognize and acknowledge the territory you're occupying. A reminder as well that in order to make your viewing experience better, that you should disconnect from your VPN if possible and to reconnect to the event. Finally, you're encouraged to submit your questions to our panelists by using the raised hand icon on the side of your screen. So with that, I'm really pleased to introduce to you our panelists for today to talk to us about predictive data for recruitment and talent management. So first, I do want to welcome Caitlin McGregor, who's the CEO and co-founder of Plum, which she founded to quantify people's potential, creating agile enterprises and successful employees by matching people to jobs where they can thrive. Caitlin is particularly passionate about supporting women to reach their full potential and believes that the best way to inspire people is to lead by example. She is also a regular speaker at women entrepreneur events and a champion of hashtag move the dial, which is an initiative dedicated to increasing the leadership of women in tech. Caitlin, thank you so much for being with us today. It's an honor to be here. Thank you for including me today. So next, I'd like to welcome Kin Choi, who's Assistant Deputy Minister of Human Resources on the civilian side at the Department of National Defense a role that he has held since 2015. Prior to this, he was Assistant Deputy Minister of Compliance, Operations and Program Development at the Labour Program at Employment and Social Development Canada, and other departments that he has served in include the Privy Council Office and Health Canada. I should also mention that he's the Chair of the Canadian Centre for Occupational Health and Safety, and serves as the Director on the Boards of the Ontario Workplace Safety and Prevention Services, as well as the OutCare Foundation. Ken, thanks. Thank you so much for being with us today. Um, thank you, Natalie. I, I think we gave you an older version of my bio, just to update that uh, I am uh, currently ADM at, in transition uh, and ADM at large. I've left my position uh, and uh, I'll be uh, transitioning to retirement. And I was a former chair of the uh, Canadian Center for Occupational Health and Safety. Thank you so much for that update, Ken. Much appreciated. And thank you for taking the time to be with us today. All right, so let's get right to it. Uh, Caitlin, I'm actually gonna turn it over to you first uh, and ask you that uh, you go over a bit of a demo of Plum and talk to us a little bit about what it is and what it does. And so without further ado, I'm uh, turning it over to you. Fantastic, well, thank you very much. I really appreciate being here. Uh, so the plan today is I'm going to take you through uh, a quick overview presentation of Plum, starting with a video from one of our key customers, Scotiabank. And it'll take less than 10 minutes to kind of give you the high level concepts. And then we're going to go straight in and do a live demo so you can see what it looks like. Uh, at the end of my presentation, I'm actually going to give you a link so you can complete your own Plum profile if you'd like to try it out firsthand. And then we're going to spend the second half opening it up uh, to questions and, and having a discussion and uh, hearing from uh, Kin as well. So uh, I'm just going to dive in and, and say, you know, the very first thing off the top is that uh, we're based in Waterloo, Ontario, and I started this company a decade ago really out of my firsthand experience of being able to see the powerful predictive ability of psychometric data. So data from industrial organizational psychology. And I saw an opportunity to really democratize access to this highly predictive data, to take the science out of the hands of very expensive consultants and academics and marry it with software so that we could allow this data to scale and really empower everyone to realize their full potential at work. And so without further ado, I want you to hear directly from how Scotiabank is using Plum in their process. As a student, your resume started with a template or you copying your BFF's layout. Hell, it might even been your career center that made it. But then it was all about wordsmithing, reviewing, 
grammar check, people looking it over, advice, constantly changing it. And for what? Congrats, you got a sheet of eight and a half by 11 that sums up what exactly? Exactly. We're not looking for some generic, over-processed, over-simplified, templated view of what you've done. We want to know what you're going to do, the real you, who you are as a person. Because here at Scotiabank, we want, scratch that, we need you to bring your whole self to work every day. Not eight and a half by 11 you. We hired the authentic you. That diversity of thinking, the different points of view, key strengths and passion. All of that allows us to solve complex problems for our clients and our people and develop the best products and technologies. Okay, don't get us wrong. All that you gain as a student through your extracurriculars, work experience, and volunteering is super valuable and has helped shape you into who you are. But doesn't that story warrant more than a five second review on a single sheet of paper? Plus, we've still got your LinkedIn. Starting now in Canada, all of our intern, co-op, and graduate program positions no longer require student resumes. Cut the bias away and meet us online, in person, at events, or get noticed by applying with your Plum profile. Because at Scotiabank, we're here for every future. So right now, especially with the great resignation, where we're seeing over half of the workforce resigning from their current jobs on the, you know, as we come out of COVID, we're seeing that people are sick and tired of just being seen as a collection of their hard skills and past experience. People really want to be seen for their potential and they want opportunities in their jobs to really thrive and continue to grow and develop and lean into the things that make them uniquely human. You know, we've heard a lot of the last five years about the future of work, and we're actually entering the second phase of the fourth industrial revolution. And what that really means is that there's this awakening that humans are really at the center of how we are going to be successful as organizations. But when we look at the technology that exists to understand humans, it's often a rear view mirror look at where someone has been. It's really not an objective of future success. What it does is it often looks at hard skills and experience straight from resumes, and cover letters, and keyword matching to job descriptions. And what happens is that historical data is embedded with the systemic barriers and biases that dictate access to education, internships, even how fast you progress in your career. But if we look at the field of industrial organizational psychology, we have over three decades of science around how to quantify human potential, how to understand if someone can thrive if just given the opportunity. Industrial organizational psychology is the science for measuring human potential, and it focuses more on those human skills, which have been dubbed soft skills. But if anything, these are the most powerful skills. They're the innate talents that exist in everybody that, you know, things like innovation and communication and execution that can now in 2021 be quantified. And when you look at what predicts long-term success, the measuring of innate talents is four times more accurate at predicting on-the-job success than past experience in education. We all know the situation where you can take a top performer like Betty at company A and drop her into company B and she's no longer a top performer. And the same thing, you could take somebody who hasn't been performing well in company A and put them into company B and now all of a sudden they're thriving. It doesn't have to do with what they've done historically, that rear view mirror perspective. I mean, you don't look in your rear view mirror to understand where you're going moving forward. And yet the technology, currently in the market that focuses on that historical data is really leaving us with only a fraction of the viewpoint that we need in order to set people up for success. So this is an example of how uh, one of our insurance companies used Plum. So Maya had been an underwriter for six years in the organization. She every year had been deemed a top performer. She, for every talent review, it had said that she had potential. But the thing is, is that Maya, after six years, was completely burnt out and looking to leave the organization. 
And so in order to retain Maya, they actually gave her a plum profile. So it's a 25 minute assessment that every single job candidate applying to Scotiabank or every single employee like Maya can complete. And you're gonna get a link at the end so you can try yours. And from the output of that 25 minute assessment, Maya was able to see what makes her exceptional. She was able to see that her ability to innovate, execute and adapt were things that came easily to her and she actually took for granted. But the reality is, is it's the areas that allow her to really excel compared to her peers. It's the areas that give her a sense of self-worth and the areas that really at the end of the day, drive her and give her energy. And specifically, we're able to look at the competencies and behaviors within innovation that drive her. And on the flip side, even with something that like innovation that she's so strong in, she still has a particular behavior that is draining. And if she is to spend more than 80% of her time on those draining activities, they would contribute to burnout. And so the company trying to understand how best to retain Maya thought, hey, after six years of being an underwriter, we should promote her to be director of underwriting. However, the behaviors that would be needed to thrive as a director of underwriting, things like conflict resolution, persuasion, and communication are all behaviors that actually drain Maya. And while she may have the eligibility to do the job, after a year, she probably would be burnt out and leave the organization. The reality is there's 37% of the population that would thrive more successfully in that role than Maya. But what they were able to do with Maya's one profile is look at all the other jobs in the organizations and all the other behavioral requirements for those jobs. And what surfaced is that Maya was a 94 match when it came to product manager. There isn't another set of technology out there that would have said based on Maya's experience that she would be strong as a product manager. However, Plum was able to reveal because innovation, execution, adaptation, and managing others were all behaviors that were important for product management at that specific company at that specific time, Maya as a 94 match. And so what happened is the company actually hired Maya and within four months, she did tons of job shadowing, reading books, attending webinars, learning everything she possibly could on product management. And by the six month mark, she was outperforming a product manager that had been hired in with 17 years of prior product management experience. And at the end of the year, Maya had been promoted to be a senior product manager. And so the reason why we are really able to do this, yes, in the first part, Maya being able to complete her own Plum profile, but the unique part about Plum and what really changes the industry is our ability to measure the behavioral needs of a job. So a job analysis is the scientific way that industrial organizational psychologists would understand the behavioral needs of the job. And typically it requires an industrial organizational psychologist to go and interview three to eight job experts. What we've been able to do is automate that interview into an eight minute survey that allows people to prioritize which behaviors are most important for the job and which behaviors are least important for the job. And we're able to have three to eight experts all complete this independently and then reveal transparently if they have alignment or not. And if they do have alignment that innovation, execution, adaptation are the most important for the job, then when we match them to a candidate or an employee, you have a high degree of confidence that they, that person will be able to adapt and thrive in the new role. Now, this is not that dissimilar to KPIs, key performance indicators. We know that we don't borrow KPIs from a competitor. We don't borrow KPIs from five years ago. Our customers are telling us roles are changing as quickly as every six months. This allows you to understand the behavioral requirements of the job moving forward. So we are quantifying instead of KPIs, key performance indicators, we're quantifying those key behavioral indicators that measure success long-term. And these can be for brand new roles, changing roles. This allows us to be dynamic at matching people to roles where they will excel. And so what happens is that when you start making decisions about people with this new objective scientific data, you start creating real impact in terms of the organization. So in the case of Scotiabank that removed resumes, what they saw is an increase in people of color within their campus hires go from 4% to 10%. They raise their visible hiring of visible minorities by 60% when other banks in Canada are just pledging 40%. Whirlpool, another customer of ours, they were able to increase the hiring of underrepresented minorities by 78%. 
And then when we're trying to retain our best employees right now, we've seen that companies like SureCall in the first year of using Tur uh, Plum, their annual turnover rate went from 30% to 6%. And so because we are able to quantify everybody's behaviors by candidates and employees all completing their Plum profile, and more importantly, being able to quantify the behavioral needs of every job, what we're doing is providing this objective universal data set to every talent decision through the entire life cycle, from hiring and onboarding, to identifying leadership potential, understanding how teams work together, to developing employees so they're better self-awareness in terms of what drives and drains them, and then matching for internal mobility, succession planning, and workforce planning. And so we typically work with uh, organizations in uh, financial institutions, in technology, in manufacturing, as well as not-for-profits in the government. And we have uh, a relationship with SuccessFactor in that we have a full integration with them as well as Workday. And then we're often brought in by consulting firms like Deloitte in order to help their, their customers as well. And so I'm gonna dive into the demo, but before doing that, and I think this is sent out by email as well, or you can just copy it down, use.plum.io slash TG1. You can go ahead and complete your own 25 minute assessment. If you did this off our website, you'd just get your top three talents, but this will unlock your full professional development guide so you can have access to all 10 of your talents. And I'm gonna start by showing you exactly what that will look like next. I need to just bring up my next monitor. You can see my, my kids here for a second. So what happens when you click on that link is that you're gonna go straight into this screen, which welcomes you to complete the Plum Discovery Survey. Now, this is industrial organizational psychology. This is a real psychometric assessment. So best practices are, it's not timed, but give yourself at least 25 minutes to finish this. You wanna make sure that you're well rested, that you're in a distraction-free environment, and you really wanna give yourself adequate time to get through this. There are three main sections that you're gonna go through. The first part is problem solving ability, which really has no language or math, which tends to discriminate against certain socioeconomic groups. Instead, we focus on something called fluid intelligence. It's how well you can handle and learn and solve a brand new problem. The next section is personality in a specific way that prevents you from faking or gaming. And even just as humans, we have a natural tendency to have a self-enhanced bias. And so this removes the ability for you to say that you are amazing at everything. It forces you to really focus on your priorities. What, if you only had a short amount of time, is the most important to you and the least important to you? So you can even just take a second here and think, you know, out of these three options, I generally respect authority. I usually finish what I start and make friends easily. Which one is most like you? Which one's least like you? And which one would you leave blank? We also do this with all negative statements. And that's when it gets really difficult because you don't want to say what's most and least like you. But it really gets to the heart of how we prioritize our time and really bringing that awareness of how can we optimize our time to lean into the things that we excel in. We also go through this with adjectives. And then this last section is called social intelligence. And social intelligence is also problem solving, but it's specifically about how you handle problem solving with humans. And so this is a work situation, and it's about what's the most effective way to respond and what's the least effective way to respond to get the most out of the people you're working with. What happens when you're done with this is you're given your own Plum profile. So I'm actually gonna take you into my own Plum profile. And so these are my top three talents and I can go ahead and share them on LinkedIn and share them with whoever I want or not. And so my top three talents are persuasion, adaptation and decision-making. It gives me a summary of ways that I can reach my career goals. And it even talks about where I'll be the happiest and questions that I can act, ask to make sure I'm in the best role for me. Now, today you can go ahead and get access to your full talent guide, which gives you instructions on how to think about this. Really the main concept for you to understand is this concept of drivers and drainers. What allows you to have a sense of self-worth and to feel fulfilled versus what is exhausting and takes you more time. And so um, it goes through again, gives you a quick summary, and then it talks about all 10 of your talents. So in persuasion, there are certain areas that drain me, but then if I go down to something like teamwork, 
it's not that I can't do teamwork. It's that I have to be conscious about it. If at the end of the day, at four o'clock, somebody's like, hey, let's go out to a happy hour and socialize. I'll often be like, no, I've got some things to do. I've got some people to follow up with. I've got some people to persuade. And I'll often say no, where this consciously makes me go, oh, I need to put more time and energy uh, into making sure this happens. So maybe I won't go every single week out with my colleagues, but I'll make a, it a priority to go out once a month or once every two months so that it's not slipping through the cracks too much. That would be a coping strategy. This makes me self-aware that it's something that I'm not naturally prioritizing and it is something that's draining on me. So I need to recognize it's gonna take more time, more effort. And like the phone battery, when you get below 20%, I can flip myself into battery saving mode by developing coping strategies. I'm not gonna become amazing at teamwork overnight, but I can put in specific methods to support me so that it becomes less draining. And so this information, allows me to have better self-awareness, but I can also go ahead and share this with the people that I work with. And if I want to have suggestions on how to talk to them about it. There's descriptions in terms of how could I have a conversation with my boss around this talent, with my peers, with my direct reports, if I want to work independently. And there's five uh, specific methods that could help me maximize my potential. And they're really just directional. A lot of companies will connect this to their uh, learning content management to say, hey, if I want to work on communication, now how can I use this as my roadmap to then dive in and work on communication more specifically? And not all elements of communication, very specific elements that are draining on me. And so that's the uh, experience that individuals go through where the magic happens, like I explained before, is really understanding what happens when we match people to jobs. So I've got a fake job here, CEO of a startup, and I can go through and see that I thought that persuasion, execution, communication, decision-making, and adaptation were the most important for this role. I can go in and invite different people, almost like a 360 on the job to understand what, uh, what other people think is important. You can see we have a lot of alignment in terms of what we think is needed. We have some differences of opinion here. This system averages it out, but I could be sitting down and having a conversation to say, hey, why do we think about this differently? Does one of us need to maybe adapt our thinking on this? Or maybe I can say, you know what, Kristen, she's, she's great, but I wanna take this role in a new direction that she's not up to speed with. I can go ahead and remove her if I want and apply those changes. And now everything dynamically changes. If I have a new individual that gets added at a later time, we can bring their opinion in, apply it, and it dynamically updates. This ability to understand what priorities are, are important for the job are because I completed an eight minute, uh, as I said, job analysis, or we call it a match criteria survey. So this is an example of, I can go through and say which two behaviors are least important and which two behaviors are most important. So for this role, adapt to other people's differences, attend to details to minimize glitches and possible errors, suggest creative or original ideas, convince people to change their minds, communicate decisions in an easily understood way, handle complaints, settle dispute, disputes and resolve grievances, which two are most important and least important. And I just go through and answer those priorities, which then give me that rank ordering of the 10 talents, which are the five in order that are most important for success. Now, when I have people's plum profiles and I have then the match criteria completed for the jobs, this is where the magic happens. And so we are able to go in and look at what's called a talent map. We are unable to understand the intersection between people and roles. And so if I look at Maya, for example, I can see all the roles that Maya matches in the system. Maya was also asked without knowing the match score, with these different titles, which one she was interested in or not, so that when I see that she's interested in something like an 83 where she's a strong match and she's interested, I now know that this is gonna be a conversation that we could have. And I can specifically see what's gonna drive and drain her and if she would be set up for success with this opportunity here or if she'd be better off with the role that's a 91 and is there an opportunity? And we can see that the 91, she's set up for greater success than the 83, but maybe it's not the right fit because of the other qualities like her eligibility of, you know, do I have time for her to get up to speed on the job or do I need somebody being productive day one? 
And so that's the intersection of we can look at people based on jobs, but I can also just look at jobs and who in the system is the are the best people uh, to match against that job. So in this case, these are all marketing jobs and these are different people that I've added. Now, the list could be much bigger depending on who you want to search for. Um, in this case, I have just under 400 people that I have brought forward and then we're seeing about 29 of them are being matched to this role. What I can also do is look at people in another way, which is understanding based on their Plum profile and looking at leadership, we're able to take a leadership profile and match it to everybody uh, in our system that has been brought into this cohort. So I've brought over 346 employees and I'm able to layer on a leadership potential framework. So everybody understands there are two tracks, a managerial track and then a subject matter expert track. There are people that are the best of the best of the best at engineering architect. And if they were to support people in a managerial position, they would be wasting their talents. They would be drained that unlocking people and being able to support them day in and day out could be incredibly exhausting, but being the best of the best of the best software architect could be really fulfilling for them and vice versa. Somebody actually might be a pretty poor individual contributor. They may not be great at getting their own work done, but they may be one of the best future leaders in your organization. The problem is, is right now when we evaluate talent, we are only able to observe behavior of what they're doing today. So people that are often excellent at being an individual contributor get ranked as having high potential. And people that aren't doing so well in their job typically don't get ranked as having high potential. But the reality is what makes somebody a leader, unless they're doing that job specifically, you're not gonna get a valuable read. So Plum brings in objective data to help you understand how to best invest in, in your people, either on the managerial track or a subject matter expert track. It allows you to look at people much earlier in their careers and invest in them, really changing the diversity of your pipeline for future leaders and helping you understand what is gonna be most successful for you in the organization. And so this is a four point scale, um, measuring leadership potential. Somebody with four diamonds, we can see ranks very high with the six dimensions of leadership, which is learning agility, drive, self-confidence, composure, and empowerment. And we can see that this person, even though there's areas to work on, is gonna be set up for success. And I can go into their talent guide to go even deeper and understand, okay, now when we have conversations, you know, what are we gonna break down and, and talk about more specifically? So this data is just about leveraging the same data in more use cases. We can see that that's a very different kind of profile than somebody who, for example, has two diamonds. We can see that they're, it's, they're not as strong when it comes to these elements that will set them up for success for a leadership role. And then the last piece that I'll show you, and then I'm done, is that we can understand people in relationships to each other um, in terms of teams. So we can go through and see, I switched into my different account. So within the case of teams, I can go through and see a group that uh, has come together, there's eight employees, and I can understand as a group what drives and drains them. And so we can see that execution is something that really drains people, but they have other talents that really allow them to be successful. And I can go through and find what those are. And as a manager, I can use these to then help my team get along, to help them achieve their team goals, and help understand how I can complement this team as we grow. And so this is all about using the same universal data set and then understanding how that can help with internal mobility, employee development, managing teams, as well as hiring, like in the case of uh, Scotiabank, where we have people applying to the bank rather than uh, just at uh, a role, in this case, they can apply to the whole company and we can go ahead and see, okay, if we've interviewed them and we think that they're great, but they're, we're not gonna hire them for this role, where else in the organization would they be a strong fit? And people, if I wanna look at the whole database, what are different people in the database that may be a fit for this role?
And so I'm going to end here and hand it over to uh, Kim. Actually, I'm just going to interject for just a quick second. So first of all, thank you so much. I think my mind is definitely blown. There's a lot there to, to absorb, and, and I'm sure I'm not alone. Um, I'd say this definitely challenges, and I will say our, because it's not just me, um, our conventional views, right, that employees can only be assessed based on um, their past experience, their already acquired skills and competencies. And I'm, I'm really taken by your statement, you know, you don't look behind to predict where you should be moving forward. Um, and I'm wondering, just before I turn it over to Ken, if you can take maybe 30 seconds, because the question came in, and I think it's very apropos, if you can respond to how you might account for employees who might have um, more experienced employees, if you will, um, who maybe like myself have kind of a longer work history that we may uh, not like to admit, um, or does this become less relevant with a tool such as this one? Well, if you look at how we prepare leaders as they get more senior, we start to take more risks on more senior leaders and allow them for internal mobility opportunities that you may not have taken the risk on with somebody junior. So we may say, you've done such a great job in this particular area. We'd love to see if we put you in a different area, if you bring a new perspective, if you bring a different approach, if you help, you know, transfer the knowledge from different parts of the organization and potentially bring in a new perspective that could help with innovation. So with senior leaders, in an ideal world, we wanna leverage that institutional knowledge in a new way. And this helps, sometimes the senior people are scared, frankly, to move into something new because they're like, what, I'm doing well. What happens if I, if I don't do well? And the company is like, we have such a, the organization says, we have such a great person. What happens if we move them into a job, they don't do well and we lose them. So what it does is it really de-risks the decision for both parties and says, hey, I know you've never done this exactly, but you're a 98 match. We think that this is gonna be a win-win and it really gives confidence before just saying, hey, we're gonna randomly throw you somewhere else and hope it works. So I think there's so much opportunity to leverage and this really is the foundation of the future of work, talking about how, you know, that people's need to change jobs um, just because jobs are changing so frequently. Like there's a natural pressure that things are gonna have to change for us to all keep progressing. And I think this really de-risks, especially for more senior people, where the right moves are gonna be. Excellent, thank you. Thank you for that. So we actually just received a question asking for an employer's perspective. So perfect uh, segue for you, Ken, to tell us about your experience using Plum as an employer as part of a recent visible minority recruitment campaign at DND, and to speak to us specifically about some of the insights I gained and lessons learned from that experience. So over to you. <clears throat> Thank you so much, Natalie. And thanks, Caitlin. I, I can listen to Caitlin speak about this stuff uh, all day. Uh, you can mm -hmm. hear the enthusiasm and so on. Um, so we, we were uh, a client, and uh, I can tell you that um, the stuff works. Uh, but it does mean that we have to set aside our own biases as we go and try to tackle some of the biases and institutional challenges. I think we shared the report uh, out uh, to participants um, in advance. So I would invite people to uh, take a look at that and take a read of uh, what we went through. Uh, we challenge ourselves uh, to think about uh, things differently and to remove the biases that are um, inherent uh, in, in the challenges we have. The clerk has challenged us uh, in terms of um, uh, better uh, diversity and inclusion strategies. And I think what, uh, what we've done in this process, we, what we set out to do, we were very successful. Uh, we used two um, uh, AI tools uh, companies, uh, Nakri and, uh, and Plum. Uh, Nakri in terms of the assessment and Plum uh, in terms of fit. Uh, and what we found was that for both, it gave us uh, a way to uh, treat people better, uh, both the uh, people that are successful and the people that were uh, not successful. And why is that the case? Uh, because we treated everybody as uh, an individual that got feedback. And both products that we, um, we use provided people with really good feedback about themselves. Um, so our ratings for uh, from everybody was very, very high because that's a bit of a strange thing. You know, we've all had uh, participation in uh, our public service processes, 
and you go into these black holes. You don't know if your application has been received. You don't know how it's being assessed. So, you know, imagine the, the, the contrast rather than having um, uh, a bunch of people looking at your CV with the mindset of eliminating people because we have too many applicants to giving everybody a fair shot at demonstrating their um, uh, their competencies and and their fit and that's what we were able to do and um, and uh, the feedback was very very positive and the results speaks for themselves as well i think caitlin shares some results i won't go through the results we have except to say and it's it's in the report is that uh, it allow us to um, um, meet our objectives and it removed all those biases that we would have. I love what Caitlin talked about in terms of, you know, uh, doing the match and that's what we're able to do. So imagine we're, we're just in mid-year uh, performance reviews. Imagine we're able to do that and have a really intelligent conversation with people based on data rather than intuition, rather than, you know, I've been around senior level boardrooms when we do interviews for senior people. You know, your last uh, uh, bit of conversation there, Natalie and Caitlin, about how we can use this. Well, imagine if we actually have these tools for the fit element and interests uh, that can predict higher rates of uh, success. Uh, that's just tremendous that we don't affect a um, large organization by placing the wrong people because it can be very, very, very disruptive. Um, we're going through quite of that uh, challenges at uh, DND, as you know, and we have we can use these tools now. And that's the challenge is that we have them available. Can we remove our own internal biases, managers intuition that we have to meet everybody and know them all so intimately because we're better judgment of these tools. If we can remove that, I think we can have very, very success. Uh, I'll leave you with one, one last um, thought on this so that people understand where, where we're coming from. Um, for those of you that are, are older, like myself, this is not Skynet, okay? This is not um, Terminator, Skynet, the AI, you know, takes over everything and you have no ability to make decisions. Uh, we did do validation exercises to ensure that the tool assess what we wanted to assess. We were very stringent in terms of our managers to make sure that they were clear about uh, what the criteria they're looking for, what the skill sets are. Um, so bottom line, in the end, uh, we got some very, very good people that went through the process and we've hired some excellent people to all the managers feedback was how impressed they were with the people we were able to, uh, to appoint. So I'll leave it there and look forward to discussions and questions. Thank you so much, Ken, and I really like what you said about, you know, often, or at least with some of our sort of pre-existing models, the, the focus, and I'm, I'm guilty of it myself, is, you know, you're reviewing the different resumes and the focus is on eliminating, right? Yeah. Um, instead of really focusing on, on potential um, in areas where that uh, person could be the best match, which I would say can be either within the organization or across the public service, which is a great opportunity that we have to start thinking talent sort of more broadly. So, so thank you for that. Uh, so look, this is great because it leaves us for some really good time uh, for questions and, and dialogue and they're coming in fast and furious. So we're going to do a bit of a kind of rapid fire and maybe I'll start with you, uh, Kim. This is very government specific, uh, but the question has to do about how to integrate this kind of approach um, to either complement information or other systems like the executive talent management system, the ETMS. Uh, which is kind of the the executive or government-wide sort of system for executives. How, how do you see this sort of leveraging those government-wide systems? Oh, what a fantastic question. I, I think the potential is enormous. It's about putting more data in, uh, you know, right now ETMS and, and our fr fr friends at Treasury Board would say the same thing, is not dynamic. It's very static. We input things and it doesn't have a way to kind of look at the, the past performance and preferences and so on. And I think Caitlin did a good demonstration of that uh, at the very end in terms of how we can use that, have that data updated, right? It's about investment of the people. Right now as executives, we put in all that ETMS. I'm not sure what happens with that information. You know, if I want to, I think there's questions like, oh, do you want to work uh, internationally? I, I say yes, but no one ever comes back and say, oh, because you said yes, here's what we're going to offer you. So imagine that we had a tool that's dynamic enough, and it's not only based on your 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 boss's 
um, views of the world, but maybe other colleagues and other deputies and other ADMs and other executives and so on, your staff. Imagine at all those level and having that and, and your own say. That's real, and then we do a match on that. I, I think it would be so much healthier that uh, people would trust the system more and would invest more in the system. Uh, I can tell you that uh, D&D, it, it is kind of really convincing people to spend their time on ETMS. I get a lot of groans every time I remind colleagues, hey, it's this time of year you have to do it. So I, I think it'd be a fantastic tool. And I hear you there, Ken. I think I've I've ticked off a couple of times my interest in sort of the intelligence and sort of security field, but CSIS has yet to knock at my door. I don't know why, <laughs> and I shouldn't be saying this because my boss is going to kill me. All right, uh, Caitlin, I have a question for you, um, specifically from um, as a from someone with um, ADHD, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, um, and they're worried that these um, psychometrics may actually automatically discriminate. Uh, against them. So wondering, the question is, how are you incorporating those that may be neurodivergent um, in these types of assessments? So there's about three different ways that, that we handle this. One is we make sure that we do adverse impact studies. And so we've also made sure we've taken everything through the Disability Act. So we've really been rigorous. Um, my background actually is that I ran uh, a software company to help students with learning disabilities to leverage technology, how to allow them to succeed. Um, my co-founder was the global expert in how to use uh, IEP students profiles in education to understand how to best leverage their strengths. It was actually that background that led us to this. How could we help not just students with learning disabilities leverage their strengths, but allow all the workforce to leverage their strengths. So we're deeply committed to making sure that this is something that is helpful and make sure that the validation studies uh, support that. That being said, at any time, if somebody feels like the results that they get at the end aren't a reflection of who they are, and they feel like there was something that they couldn't get through, there's always, um, it's right there a way to raise your hand and say, you know what, I need to have a conversation outside of this. I think that um, these results are not reflective of who I am because of, of this reason. And then every single employer will talk to you directly um, if that's the case. However, going through it, seeing your own results, has been transformational for most people because a lot of the times it's really about how do you set yourself up for success? All of us have certain areas that we thrive in and if we could just advocate for to leverage those on a more regular basis, it's game changing for our own careers and happiness. And so I would say go through it and see if those results are reflective of you and if we have been able to, to address this. And if you don't feel that way, feel free to reach out to us or the employer in question. Great, thank you for that. Um, I'll stay with you for a second. Two very probably super quick questions. The first, is it available in French? And the second, uh, does this tool use machine learning or AI? So it's available in 12 languages, including French, Canadian, and European French. And so absolutely. Normally when you log in, it'll automatically adjust to your browser, but there's also drop down. You can change it um, at any time and you can get your results, you know, regardless of what language you can switch your results into the different languages too. And then, so AI is a very, 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 very broad term. And so to some extent, this is AI in that we've taken the expertise from IO psychology and the expertise of all the algorithms and validation studies and all the calculations, and we've automated it. And so this is an expert, an automation of the expert's opinion, which loosely fits into AI. It's not machine learning in that we are doing validation studies. We know exactly why every single calculation is happening in every single output and there isn't any self-learning that's happening. We do separate validation studies and then manually update things. The reason for that is based on employment law, you need to understand why you're selecting one person over the other and it has to be job relevant. And this way we are able to understand 100% that this is job relevant. There's no black box, there's no pattern recognition. And so we're able to avoid a lot of the ethical problems with some of the black box machine learning um, components. And really this is about industrial organizational psychology being leveraged at scale. Great, thank you for that. Uh, Kim, this is again, a different way of doing things. 
And I'm wondering if you can comment on what different skills do you think are required by both managers, HR professionals in terms of best leveraging this kind of approach? Thanks. Now, I, I think it's really more, not so much about skills, but mindsets, um, is uh, removing our own biases and thinking about how we can make things better. You know, let's all, you know, be honest that uh, HR gets criticized day in and day out because processes take a long time and uh, we um, are very transactional in nature. And I think uh, what this types of tools offer is for us to really um, be strategic in, in, that, in that real sense of being strategic and having better outcomes. And I think it requires both um, HR professionals and managers to think about things very, very differently. We, we've tried th similar things to, you know, um, simplify things and so on, but we always go back to these heavy processes because that's what we know, that's what we're comfortable with. So we have to allow ourselves to be uncomfortable to let go to have the validation and so on, but but to understand what the benefits are and let that drive drive what we want to do, you know. Um, when we went into the visible minority process, um, I was naive. Um, so this is on a you know in the, in the, in the, right in the midst of the Black Lives Movement and all the indis indigenous things that we're seeing, um, you know, in Canada and and abroad. And so I was naive to automatically think that everybody would buy into this. And we have to be, I think, um, very collaborative and, and reaching out to people to understand that people have these systems set up, right? We're, we're institutions in the public service, and we're, we're going to have to break these things down to allow ourselves to experiment and pilot. But that's what we did, and we found it to be very successful. And I, I, I would guarantee if people start small, piloting, adopt some of these tools, they're going to find they're going to get better results, better outcomes for their own people. HR professionals are not going to have to go through every single CV to make sure that people have the things that they said that they have. If you compare the tools that we use today to what's available that's dynamic through organizations like Plum, uh, you're going to see a much better product. And so I would invite people so much, uh, especially HR professional managers, to let go of the old practices, try this experiment, see if you think you, we can get better results. That mindset, I, I like that. Um, Caitlin, how do you, so I'm, I'm coming back on this notion of, of bias and, and the potential to that this has to better eliminate bias. So how do you account for bias in, in, in your system? So a big part of this, again, is double checking the science and using best methods to make sure that um, we are doing what we, that we are sticking to the best in class science that exists and, and creating the best job relevant results. And so the main part to make sure that we are eliminating bias is to do what's called an adverse impact study. So making sure that our results are not negatively impacting a certain protected group. And so not only do we do that internally, but our customers also do that as well. So Bloomberg's been a customer for over three years. They use us globally um, all over the world, and they're able to really segment the data to say, you know, are there any adverse impact when they're being when this is being used in Canada and the US? Is there any adverse impact when it's being used overseas in Japan, for example? And is there any change in difference between the countries? And so we have thorough, thorough, thorough um, analysis to make sure there's no adverse impact. So that's a big part is making sure we've got the science right. And, and that's the thing that I'm the most proud about is that we've been able to ensure that we have best in class science. The second piece is then encouraging our customers to use it using best practices. A lot of assessments in the past have been used at the end of the hiring process. So they'll bring in a whole bunch of resumes, they'll screen them based on that historical data, they'll get to a short list of maybe two, three, up to 10 people, and then have them go through the assessment and basically piss people off, excuse my language, by saying, oh, I thought this person was great and now it's saying it's not, or I didn't like this person, now it's saying it's great. And it's, you know, it's really allowing assessments to make the final decision and that's not at all how it should be used. The best way to use this data is to understand that it is four times more accurate at understanding long-term success. So it is the most objective predictive data. It should be used as early in the process as possible with the mindset of screening in 
people that you may never have even thought about in the past. You know, it's about opportunities and it's about recognizing that you are going to get the most out of people based on giving them opportunities that they may never have done before. And so screening in, creating that shortlist based on potential, and then bringing in other tools that assess for eligibility and readiness to say, hey, do we need this person hitting the ground running right away or do we have time to train them? Okay, based on our shortlist, based on our geography, based on our, you know, salary, and then, you know, reference checks. We do reference checks at the very end of the process, not at the very beginning. So it's about getting these steps in order to get the best outcomes. And that's also you know, mitigating bias through structured interviews. So we have yep. a structured interview guide that then reinforces, you said these were the most important behaviors for the role, let's make sure you're actually interviewing on that. And so it's really about, you know, making sure you're using the data correctly. And part of what we do is we really work with our customers as part, even though we're a software company, it's part of the service to work with our industrial organizational psychologists, to work with our customer success managers, to make sure that we're helping with the change management in terms of the mindset and the, the flow of how this data is being used. Can I jump in on, on one please, key please. point that Kaylin just mentioned, and it's the word of screening in people versus what we do today, which is screening people out. Think about that in terms of inclusion um, uh, characteristics and of uh, the public service. If we can do more of these types of things with large, I think uh, it would do so much uh, more good in the public service. So I love that idea that this allows us to screen people in. Agreed. And again, it's a complete um, shift in mindset, uh, right, which uh, we're not uh, as readily used to. Uh, Caitlin, a, a couple of questions more on the practical side. So um, how do you protect the data and where is the data stored or housed? If you can comment on that, please. Um, so we have really, really strong uh, data, data privacy uh, um, kind of agreement so that when you go in and complete your plum profile, it explains exactly how the data is going to be used and all of that is in there. So because we work internationally, it's all GDPR, GDPR compliant. And so um, the data is something that we care about first and foremost, is like kind of hand in hand with the accuracy of the science. So the first thing is, is that as an individual, you own your own data. First and foremost, we did this even before GDPR. And so it's like your LinkedIn profile. You are allowing the employer to have access to the data. But if you want to go and apply to the government and then go apply to Scotiabank, you're not taking the assessment again. You know, if you want to apply to multiple jobs, you're not retaking it. You own that single plum profile and you have access to that data and you decide who you are going to share it with. So that's first and foremost and, and really big game changer in terms of how we think about data privacy because all the privacy is about how, how do you have control of that data and you opt in and agree to how it's being used. Um, in terms of where is the data stored, um, so this is something where, you know, currently we use Amazon Web Services, AWS, and so it's stored on AWS. Um, only in the last few years has uh, Canada had AWS available, and it's a very large cost to spin up an a parallel system in Canada. So today it's still stored in AWS US. However, we are in active conversations to see if there's a, you know, a, a financial a way for us to um, parallel our data in Canada. If there is enough need, it's something that we are kind of ready to press go on, but it needs to be in parallel to an actual opportunity. Um, and so that's something we can do kind of quickly. Um, but like I said, we, we need to have a real opportunity in front of us uh, for us to justify the opportunity and, and the cost as, as a growing business. Great, thank you for that. Um, I'm just doing a quick time check. Time is a running out. Um, I'm gonna see if I can sneak in a couple of, of quick, quick questions for sort of a, a quick response. Ken, I know that not everyone uh, that's viewing this may have necessarily yet received uh, or seen the report, so we'll make sure to share that out. But if you can speak to, there's a couple of questions here coming along those lines of how you integrated uh, our very well-known uh, leadership competencies into uh, the process that you undertook here working with, with Plum on this process. Um, sure. Um, by the way, before I start, I think LinkedIn is also uh, stored in the U.S. as well, so I think many people use LinkedIn. Um, uh, we it really um, forced us to uh, uh, push our manager in our thinking when we started the process. I wanted to ensure that we had uh, lots of 
uh, folks to help us. So we created um, an assessment board and a review panel of uh, people from outside uh, to, to kind of, you know, uh, be not an audit function, but really provide us with an, uh, the advice. And then we took a look at uh, the key leadership competency, which is our already really, really well spelled out by the PSC and the Treasury Board. Um, so we didn't reinvent the wheel. We gave those uh, KLCs uh, to um, uh, Dockery in particular, and uh, they programmed it to make sure that they were assessing it. And as you, if people um, recall, the KLCs are actually, you know, developed and um, describe in terms of what you expect at the EX1 level, at the EX3 level, at the ADM level, and so on. So we apply those and we allowed NACRI uh, to uh, then uh, program it into it. Uh, and with NACRI, I should just take a moment to describe that as well because it's it's not like a video um, where I think there's a lot of video uh, interview uh, products that are going on right now. Um, what we liked about that product was that it, um, as it took what people use as a video, it captured and articulated um, the words, and then use that to assess against what we were looking for. So it really took out all the biases of how people may interact in the video and so on. So we had a lot of questions about that. And I, I think that was what was really uh, great about it. And then once they passed the, the knockery, again, they got a full report back on so on, uh, the highest ranking folks then went on to using the plum, and then we use that to help match uh, where people would have uh, good success in the various jobs that we had uh, available. So um, I was very confident that the KLC were very well assessed. Awesome. Super quick final question before I wrap it up. Caitlin, how do you account, because this comes up often in, in the context of not everyone necessarily having equal or equitable access to education and wondering if you look at education as a screening criteria. I think it's a question of eligibility and we really, really, really need to dig deep and say, if you have a rock star, there are a 99 match based on the behaviors that you need in the role. They have, you know, they have transferable experience. Are you really going to say no because they don't have that education or is it worth at least having a conversation with the person and at least considering them and maybe potentially giving them an opportunity through maybe an op, you know, there's many ways of bringing people in and giving the opportunity to see if it's really a, a need or if it's a nice to have. And most of the research is clear. It is a nice to have, not a need. And so you're seeing organizations like Ernst & Young removing resumes entirely. You're seeing Scotiabank removing resumes entirely. I think that it gave us safety and a sense of security before, but it's not accurate or valid predictor of future success. And so I think we really need to change our thinking around that criteria and where it's needed. You know, if you're a surgeon, I want you to have your, your qualifications. So let's just make sure we're applying it to the right places. Amazing, amazing. So look, I didn't uh, get to all of the questions that are continuing to come in. So perhaps um, we'll work here with the team to see if we can sort of provide responses to some of the outstanding ones. But if I can just capture it in some of the, so many, so many more things that uh, I'm left with um, that I can have time to account for. But if I could say just a couple of things, I mean, I'm really taken by, you know, human potential data versus historical data. Uh, not simply looking behind to predict where we should be moving forward. Um, and I think my favorite one is screening in versus screening out. So those are some of my takeaways. I have many more, uh, but we're out of time. So I just want to say, first of all, a huge, huge thanks to Caitlin and Kim for taking the time to be uh, with us today and engaging us um, in today's discussion. I think a lot more for us to, to think on and reflect um, and really appreciate it as well, the candidness of, of your remarks and openness to kind of share your insights with us. So thank you, thank you so much uh, on my behalf and that of the school. And for everyone who joined today, thank you so much for your active participation. It was great. I wish we could have a part two. Maybe we should plan for it, I don't know. Um, but I do wanna encourage you as well to join the GC data community to, to know what else is coming with uh, Data Demo Week and future events along these lines. So with that, it's 12 o'clock. I've taken us to time. Sincere thanks to everyone and have a great, great rest of your day. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye. Thanks.